everyone. I am so excited today because I get to interview author Kristen Harmel. I am so excited about that. Oh my God. We are going to be talking about her brand new novel just released called The Room on Rue Amelie. And I keep saying it different. I'm going to get her to say it because I know it's going to sound way cooler than when I say it with my Pennsylvania Dutch accent. But anyway, what a story. This is my perfect book, okay? Historical fiction. It was set in Paris. I learned so much about what Paris went through during World War II. Um, you know, there's a lot of World War II historical fiction books out there, but this one... I don't know. I put a couple of them over in the Oh My God books, okay? And that's one of these books. So everyone, here is Kristen. Hi, everyone. I am so excited today because I get to speak with author Kristen Harmel. And we're going to be talking about her brand new book just released this week, The Room on Rue Amelie. Hold that book up. We have to see this. We have to appreciate this cover. Oh my gosh. And I see the inside. Okay, so that color pop of that teal, I see on the inside I cover flap, they also carried the cover, the color yes, over. Yes, yeah, it's like, yes, I know. I, I, let's just make this whole interview about showing this beautiful cover. I'm so impressed. And you it's said um, the cover, the, the letters are raised, and oh, yeah, I the love letters it. are raised. They did, they just did such a good job with it. I've never liked a cover of mine as much as I love this cover. The designer is Chelsea McGuckin. She did an awesome job. <laughs> I love, I love that outlook over Paris. Me too. I mean, and when you read the book, you're even going to love the cover more, which Thank is like, you. <laughs> which is what I always love about a good cover because when you're done with the book, you even appreciate the cover more. You know, that completely makes sense. I agree with you. Yes. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't understand. I do understand why people want to wait for paperbacks because of price but on amazon the price is not that much lower so everyone buy the hardcover because really right right now i mean you can wait six months or whatever long it takes for paperback but it doesn't lower the price that much anymore it's like a dollar or two less now and and then you have this beautiful hardcover that you can hang on to yeah. right and it, you know even i think a lot of independent bookstores even do sales on new releases so right. you know you can you can even get deals at stores like that too on hardcovers but yeah yes. i'm the same I, I don't buy a ton of hardcovers but i don't know <laughs> if, if you just want to go buy the cover the cover's worth it absolutely and and let's look at the binding because everybody's making artwork on instagram on the um the, the, binding. the back i mean the the part that's oh, yeah, oh, that oh this you're talking about yeah yep Look at that. I mean, because I don't know if you've seen those people on Instagram. They will make bookcase artwork. Oh, they're those. beautiful. I know. Is that just yes. incredible? Yet I one more skill I don't possess myself. Absolutely. And then there's a girl on Instagram who, who does her nails in the book cover. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. She, she, I'm not even kidding. I will look to see if she's done your book yet because she goes through all the new books and does her nails. Like, I don't know how she does it. She, like, screen... I know my mouth oh, is so hard. That I don't want to look. Is I don't so cool. But anyway, that would be. We'll just suggest it to her because that's a good cover for that. <laughs> that would be exactly. I'm all for that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Kristen, I am so happy that I get to talk to you. You have no idea. I was doing happy dances all week. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to get to talk to you too. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I was telling you, I was listening to the audio book, and it is. The woman who did it, and I didn't even look up her name. I wanted to look up her name. I think it's Madeline Maybe, and she did such a fantastic job. I mean, I, yeah, I, I um, it, it's the first time I've listened to an audiobook of mine and thought, like, wow, they completely, completely nailed it. I, I thought. I mean, that's exactly the voice I imagined for the narrator. Yeah, and, you know, I know a lot of authors won't listen to it because they're afraid of, the, yep. of that. You know, they're afraid that they didn't get it. But everyone who loves audiobooks too, if that's another thing for you, because I I do both. I you know I kind of live my life on audio and Kindle and hard and go back and forth. But this was so worth it. I mean, she had me in tears. At the end. Oh, she, just, she really she really did a great job. And I think and the first and the last chapter are narrated by a, a man because that's how it is in the book too. Yeah. Um, and the, I believe that uh, that man's name is uh, Jacques. 
Jacques Roy, maybe? Oh I think it's God. Jacques Roy. But that was so good, too. I thought, like, he opened the book and oh. closed the book so well, and then, yeah, she did a great job in the, in the in between. I actually wrote to Madeline on Facebook. I found her on Facebook just to tell her what a great job she did. And I, I said, like, I think you might be like the book more. Like, I think you made it better. So. I mean, I don't know because I can't compare because I only listen. But I can only imagine because I do read so many, and I think that – her, the, the inflection in her voice and, and when she was going through stuff at the end, like, I think she had me more, it's like watching a movie, you know, it's like more yeah. in tears because, you know, she sped up when she needed to. And I was like, oh my God, what's happening? Oh, <laughs> like, that's awesome. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. I really liked listening to her reading it also. Oh, <laughs> yes. oh my goodness. What a story. I read, I told you, historical yeah. fiction is like a thing. And a lot of people have been like, I, I love how people will say, oh, all you do is historical fiction books. And then lately they're like, oh, all you do is thriller books. No, I do whatever books are like coming out. Like, yes. You know, <laughs> it kind of comes in waves, right? Yeah, sometimes they kind of go in waves. And yep. I haven't read a historical fiction book in a while. So I was so happy. I was like, oh, my God, I get to read history. And then it's on World War II. And it's set in Paris. I mean, this is just like, you know, it's crazy. Aww, that's but awesome. I never read a book that explained – um, and that's what I love about historical fiction. Everybody takes it on from a different point of view. And that's I learned really a lot about what was going on in Paris. And I've read a lot about what was going on in France, but not in the inner city like of the Paris. And I got a whole new appreciation. And I'm, I'm doing World War II. I'm a homeschooling mom, by the way. And I'm oh, doing okay. World War II right now with my son. Oh. And we're studying Winston Churchill. So we're, we're in England. But I like oh, kind of – yeah, so it's like, but uh, but it was really up my, you know, I was like, oh, I got to tell him, like, we got to watch a movie or something about, you know, something in Paris, because, yeah. because every city went through something, but, you know, Paris, it was like, they got stuck, because they got, yep. they got taken over early on, yeah. and then, and then, like, they, their soldiers were fighting for, you know, Germany, but they didn't want to, and it was just like this whole, like, I don't know. I thought you did such an amazing job with that. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, never mind the love story, you know, because that was just a little love story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Because like, oh, don't we all just love a good love story and mixed in with, you know, mixed into any of our books. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just loved Ruby so much, and Thank you know, you. her heart was just, I don't know, was she, like, one of your favorite characters that you've written? You've written a lot of books, so. Yeah, it, this is my 10th novel, and um, I would say, you know what, Ruby, no one's asked me that yet. I, I actually do think Ru Ruby is my favorite character I've ever written. Yeah, that's weird. I guess she is. Um, Ruby, or maybe it, my 2014 book, The Life Intended, um, I really liked Kate, the main character of that novel, but I think Ruby is my favorite, and I think it's partially because she goes through a similar journey to, uh, to the journey that I went through when I moved to Paris myself in my 20s. Um, so, of course, I didn't move to Paris to the backdrop of World War II. I'm not that old. My 20s weren't that long ago, <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, I, I did move to Paris sort of thinking I was one type of person and I really sort of found out who I was there if that makes sense I only lived there for three months but it was really the summer I found myself and I think in much the same way Ruby is sort of forced to discover who she really is um, in, in Paris so I think it was a journey that had a lot in common with my own journey and maybe that's why I feel such a closeness to Ruby yeah and you know it's I don't do any spoilers so this isn't a spoiler but you know she didn't have to be there I mean, the, right. the beginning of the book really shows how, you know, she was very set on, you know, I'm going. And she knew, she knew it wasn't going to be easy. She, I yeah. think she didn't know it was going to be difficult either, but she knew it wasn't going to be easy, but she still went. And so, well, yeah. you know, I thought that that well, was kind of cool too. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, it, um, it, at the beginning of the book, she marries a French man and moves off to Paris just before the war begins. Um, and I think she has a window of opportunity where she could have chosen to come home to the States and she decides to stay. Um, and I think she decides to stay because of her loyalty to her husband, but also because she sort of made this decision and she's decided this is where my life is going to be now. And I think it's with that first decision that you don't just leave when the going gets tough that she begins to sort of define herself. And then I think that sets her on uh, the path that ultimately shows her who she is. Yeah. 
and there are so many quotes. I'm, I'm like a huge quote person. But when I'm <laughs> listening to the audio, it's hard because you kind of have to like stop it and then write it down. And right. you know, that was just my life in the last two days. But I, did, I so I did stop it at this one point, and I was actually I was in my car going to the grocery store. Okay, <laughs> yesterday I pulled over. And I was like, uh, because I will never be able to find this quote, and I have to write it down. So that's how how much I loved it because I did Thanks. hear lots of them, but this one I actually pulled over to write down. Oh, I can't so wait, wait to hear which one it is. It's okay. awesome. <laughs> that's one thing faith is especially good for, giving us strength in time of crisis. And to me, like when that came up, and I'm, I don't even know exactly when it came up. I can't even tell you exactly. I know you know where it is, but. I, no, I actually, I actually don't. don't. I, was say, <laughs> well, I don't actually have any idea where that is in the book either. <laughs> But to me, it, it came up at a time when it, I was thinking, you know, I've had certain things in my life and, you know, certain, and I was like, oh, that just like so wrapped it up. I mean, that's what it's there for. I mean, how do you ever know what faith you have if it's never, if you never have to put it to use? And, that's you know, point. so I, I felt like that just really, you know, I was like, yes, I love that. I love that. And, and the theme of it comes up again. This quote came up, but the theme of the faith thing keeps coming up. You know, I think a lot of people had to find their faith in the darkness of World War II, just like I think a lot of us have to find our faith in our own darkest hours. So I think it's something that kind of um, was especially meaningful during that time period, but I think it has sort of relevance today, too. I mean, and I think you're right. You don't really know how strong your faith is until it's, it's tested. So, and, and I think that goes not just for religious faith, but faith in ourselves, faith in others, faith in, you know, faith in the idea that um, life is going to turn out the way it's supposed to, the, you know, those sort of things. I think we have to find faith in all of that. Yeah, I do. And I, I love that. It's like, the, to me, it was the underlying theme. Now everybody's going to get something different because as a reader, it's all, also where we are in our life. But um, yeah. My oldest, yeah, that's true. You know, wherever we are, that's what yeah. we're going to see. But my oldest daughter just moved here from Dallas, and she's pregnant with her third child, and her husband oh. started a new job. And, you know, she's like, how can I do this? I don't know. And I'm like, you just have to believe. You just, And I, when I was yeah. – especially when I got to the end, I was like, I am sounding just like, like – because sometimes you just have to. You've got no other choice. If, if, things, if circumstances, you can't, it doesn't look logical, you know, you could get really hung up in the logic of it. And she could yeah. have gotten really hung up in, this isn't going to end. This isn't going to yeah. end well, you know? That's, that's, that's a good point. point. Yep, yeah, you're, you're totally, totally right. right. Yes. Yeah, but, but you're, you're right. right. The, the main character does continue to have faith all along. Yep. Yeah, even when it's hanging on by a, you know, a thread. She's yeah, like, by a thread, absolutely. Well, you you know, when you get down to what your choice is to not have it or have it, what are you going to do? You know, it's like you might as well have, you might as well hold on to what little you can and, you know. That, that is hours. absolutely true. I, you know, and, and I, I'm a big believer just in my own life, too, that that if you – if you do the right thing or endeavor to do the right thing, if you try to be good to other people, if you try to be good and kind and kind of put good things into the world, um, that's going to come back to you. Not every time. I mean, terrible things are going to happen, but you're going to have bumps in the road and hurdles. You have to you know, make it pass. But yeah, what did you say? Bangs on knees? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was just telling you before this started that I broke my knee oh. recently. Yes. Uh, literally cracked the kneecap straight in half, clean in half. Um, so yes, that has been a hurdle in the road for me. But, um, but but just in general, like I think if you put sort of good things out there, it, right. it's ultimately going to come back to you. And I think that's kind of something that the um, the characters in this novel discover too. I, and I think that you can then look back, um, kind of like she did, and you can look back and see, you know, like oh, well, it did do this. Like you can always see a good in something. You know? That's such a good point. Yep, you're right. You can always see a good and. You know, of course, she had her goods. And, and like you said, even everybody that was going in Europe, I mean, if they held on to the good, I feel like those were the survivors, the ones who could hold on to what was good, you know? Yeah, that's such a good point. Yes, yes. And I, I think you need that kind of that kind of belief in the future, especially during those hours of darkness. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe that it's your 10th book. I mean, I was starting to write your books down this morning. <laughs> breakfast and I'm writing down Kristen's books, you know, because I always like to do that to see like how often your books are coming out. And and on Amazon, it kept going, and I'm like, okay, she's written a lot of books. I give up. She's written a lot of books. <laughs> like, 
Okay, there have been a bunch. There yeah, have been my, a bunch. You look so young. How did you write? How is it? Oh, your thanks. Pen? That's what? so nice of you. I'm I'm not that young. Thank you. Um, yeah, my first book came out in 2006, and I wrote it. I think I wrote it in 2003 slash 2004. So I've been doing this for a while. Um, uh, and my first round of books were um, were Chiclet and Young Adult, and then I kind of transitioned in 2012 with The Sweetness of Forgetting, which is uh, sort of a blend between historical fiction and contemporary fiction. It also involves Paris uh, in World War II. <laughs> so um, that's it, it's subject matter I really enjoyed writing about then, and I was so pleased to be able to come back to it with The Room on Rue Amelie. Yeah, and okay, so we, and we talked about your past life. I mean, you were a reporter for people or a journalist for people. So you were like traveling. I would assume that you're traveling, right? Yeah, it was a really neat job. Um, it was something that I did uh, right out of college, and I did it for a long time. I think I worked for people. Toward the end, I was kind of scaling my hours back because I was spending more and more time on novels and traveling for novels and things like that. But um, I think all told, I worked uh, about 12 years for them. Um, and and it, was, it was wonderful. I had so many cool experiences. Um, I started out just kind of generally uh, doing general reporting for them. So I got to do such cool stuff, like go to the Super Bowl. I got to go to the MTV Movie Awards. I got to um, hang out with Outkast. I got to hang out with Matthew McConaughey, Ben Affleck, like just all these cool, cool experiences. Um, but by the time I ended with people, I was doing more of the Heroes Among Us stories, mm -hmm. which are the stories of normal people doing heroic, amazing things in everyday life. Um, and that, um, that I think, is, is and was much more in tune with kind of where I was going with my books, too. Um, and actually, now that I think about it, doing all that kind of fun celebrity stuff was kind of the type of book I was writing at that time, too. So I guess my, my book life has sort of followed my magazine life. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's really funny because in my era, you know, back in the 80s and 90s of magazines, I mean, mag magazines are still a little bit, you see them at the grocery store, but back in the heyday of magazines, you know, things would hit like the National Enquirer and the Star, right? But if they had made people, you were like, oh, it's true. It's uncanny. It was, yeah, of course. It, everything in people, honestly, I can tell you it really is true because they vet everything. So right. yes, everything in people is true. But yeah, I know you're completely right. If it was on, if it was in People Magazine, you could say, all right, well, that's actually a fact. Yes. <laughs> and, and, I don't know. That was always my world of, because my mom used to buy like every magazine. She was really into it. But, and I remember, you know, all the rumor ones, but if it hit people, I was like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> it's in people. You know? Oh, wait a minute. That's yeah, like exactly. a really respectable thing. I mean, it was always, it was a very respectable magazine. And, very you know, so I've always had a love for People Magazine. But, um, okay, so now that I do interviewing, who was your favorite interviewer? Like, and I shouldn't say favorite. Who was your most interesting interviewer? Um, there, there are two. That's actually a, a good question because it kind of leads into talking about the book a little bit too. Um, one of the people who inspired me to write about the Holocaust um, – uh, it, not that this book is about the Holocaust, but The Sweetness of Forgetting, my 2012 book, involves the Holocaust, and it was during researching that book that I first came up with the idea for The Room on Rue Amelie, so it, one thing kind of led to the other in terms of World War II Paris. But to answer your question, my favorite interview for people was a man named Henry Landworth, um, not a celebrity. It was one of those Heroes Among Us stories. Um, he founded an organization called Give Kids the World, which gives um, terminally ill children and their families uh, a dream vacation. So it brings them to Orlando and they get to go to Disney World or Universal or, you know, the Space Coast or whatever it is they want to do while staying at this medically equipped village, right? So he founded it, um, but he was a Holocaust survivor and he had spent uh, from age 13 to age 18 in concentration camps. Oh. And um, he founded Give Kids the World because his childhood had, had been stolen from him and he felt that this was a way to give childhood back to children whose childhoods were also being stolen in the same way. And his two best friends had been Walter Cronkite and John Glenn. And I had the opportunity to talk to both of them. And both of them said he was the most extraordinary man they'd ever met. So to think about all the people that John Glenn and Walter Cronkite met, <laughs> and this was the most extraordinary man, he was really, it, it is really just an inspiring, incredible human being. So um, that, that story really stayed with me. And I think stayed in my head and became sort of one of the foundations for the sweetness of forgetting in 2012. Yeah. And I think we all get a little bit of like celebrity craze, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, I can tell you my celebrities too. <laughs> right. Yeah, we get a little bit celebrity crazed and, you know, and, um, I was talking with a woman who was part of the Paul Popper writers. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great group. Great group. And I said to her, I'm like, 
like everybody's like, I want to go to the Oscars. I'm like, I want to go to a tall poppy convention and meet all no these people. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, like when it comes right down to it, people are people, and it's like yeah. you know, I mean, I I I've had my celebrity you know things too, but and then when it comes right down to it, it's like, oh, I don't want to sit at the Oscars. I want to talk to these women that I interview all the time and I'm friends with, and you know, all in one room. Oh. <laughs> so. So, so are you saying I'm sort of your Matthew McConaughey? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I did. You know, I did a happy dance this week. I have to tell you, it's just, I think it's so awesome. I'm really happy that the mistake that I made in putting your publicist name in my book, it turned out so well because on Monday's thing, it was so awesome. Like if I, I wouldn't have said half as much stuff about it if I would have known. <laughs> So, it worked out all right. I know, so it all like always works out like that, and that's awesome. But you know, anyway, and like I said, when I so when I got to your book, I'm like thinking, okay, so it, you know, I thought it was like your third book because I saw it was like 2014, 2016. That's why it was just incredible to see that you've written ten books. And, oh, thanks. And so now you're doing all. I mean, you're getting amazing. I mean, that's why I knew about it because all my book reviewers on. Instagram and Facebook are like, read this, read this. They've been saying that oh, for months so now. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's I mean, nice of you to say. Yeah, <laughs> it's on the top of everybody's list. But So you're doing all the publicity for this right now, but are you in the process of also writing the next one? I am, and it's going to be also partially set during World War II. It's just a time period I really um, – yeah. I just have such an affinity for I think there are so many interesting stories that can be told to the backdrop of that war. And I think they're stories that really resonate today. Um, so yes, I am in the midst of working on another World War II book. Um, but my writing schedule has just changed so much. I have a, I was telling you earlier, I, I have a two year old son. And when I wrote the first draft of the room on Rue Amelie, he hadn't been born yet. I was writing this. I, I wrote almost the entire book while I was pregnant with him. And then I did all the, you know, the additional drafts and all the editing and all that after he was already here. But, um, it, um, it, everything has just changed. I mean, I've gone from having, you know, 50 to 60 hours a week to write to having about 15 hours a week to write. Right. So I'm a little bit slower than I used to be. But yes, I am working on another novel and I'm really excited about it. Well, I always think it's so inspiring because when I was raising my children, I that's all I did for the most part. I worked yeah. some of the time, but then after the fourth child, I gave up and I stayed home. Oh, but, I, <laughs> I don't know how you do it with that many children, my goodness. <laughs> but I always pass on to my daughters and my daughter-in-laws is like, have a thing. My one daughter-in-law is a photographer and I'm like, you know, she's a mom of three, and I'm like, but have your thing, have your thing, and I think you guys in this next um, generation, you're really tuned into that, because the kids are, you know, it's like, um, flash, go forward, flash forward uh, 16 to 18 years, and they're off to college, and you're like, what am I going to do? <laughs> that that completely <laughs> makes sense. You know, it, it's, I think it's hard to find that balance, though. I mean, yes. Very for hard. Me, it, it, for me, I, I have one child, and like I said, he's two. So I'm not really a new mom anymore. I, you know, I've adjusted to it now for two years. But um, I still – there were so many years there because I had him a little bit later. I had him at um, – I'm almost 39 now, so I had him at almost 37. And so for all those years before that, I was a writer. I mean, that's how I defined myself. I was a reporter, then I was a writer, and that's who I was. And then to have to kind of change that definition and be, okay, well, now I'm first and foremost a mom. Mom. And, you know, I'm also a writer, but mom is such an important job to me right now. It's been really hard to kind of um, figure out who I am in the midst of all that. So that's sort of something I've struggled with. And I think something that I will maybe continue to struggle with over the next few years. But yeah, I, I do think it's important to kind of hang on to something, you know, the pieces of who you were before you became a mother and then integrate them into the person you are now, if that makes sense. No, and, you know, really big with the women's movement that's out there. I always find it very interesting because it, there's cycles with women. Yeah, it was like yeah, in the seventies and eighties, it was like, everybody go back to work. So I worked as a young mom. I worked. Yeah. And then it was like, no, you should be staying home. You should not be working. You should be raising your child. And I was like, you're right. I'm so overwhelmed. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to work. <laughs> like, like we kind of followed the things. And that's why I try to say like, my daughter saw me just wrap my life around them. I homeschooled. I had six children. Yeah. I just, you know, my whole life. Six, and not that six, I regret because I don't oh, regret. Of course, yeah. I don't regret. But also as they were leaving, Thing, a part of me kept leaving and then I was like yeah. what am I going to do when I you know what am I without them you know so I kind of say to them just hold on to that piece of you because they yeah. are going to say goodbye 
and then you know you you don't want to you know so it's like making that and we have to make that balance and and I don't have all the answers but I know that women in my generation are all like okay we did the working then we stayed home then we, and now it's like now they're all leaving us and we're all trying to find ourselves again and you know so you know it, it's interesting hearing you mention that about how we've kind of gone through phases in terms of you know do you work do you stay home because you're right there have been sort of societal shifts from one to the other. Mm -hmm. But I think what's important to remember, though, is through those shifts, generation after generation of child has turned out totally fine, (laughs) right? (laughs) So I I think that maybe at the core of it, whether we work or whether we don't work, or whether we work part-time or whether we work full-time or whatever, I mean, I I think at the core of it is just like the kind of parent you are in the hours that you are with your children. You know what I mean? And, 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 you know, making sure that they're somewhere safe and educational or whatever in the hours that you're not able to be with them. So I, I think that's it. And I, and I, that I, is a, such you, a good point. You really, it really is like you think you've got this like magical cure for childhood that your children are somehow going to end up being better if you do a certain thing. But, they, you know, yeah. my mom worked and then, you know, and then I did for some and didn't for some and they are all the same. They just turn out, they just grow up and, you know. You know, I think I think your kids turn into who they are because That's of the right. lessons you get. You know, the exactly. lessons you instill in them, and like the kindness and the, you know, the way you teach them how to treat other people. Those are the things that stick. I think so. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just I think we all we all have different journeys, but you know, just try to be the best parent you can be, right? I mean, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Oh no, that is absolutely it's true. You just you know, and every child is different, and every you yeah. know instance is different, and every age you are and age they are. Because I was your age when I had my last one. Which, okay, yeah. It, it, see, so what a different journey we were both on. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm an old mom. But then old moms became a thing. Older women. <laughs> so it's like, okay. <laughs> Although I'll tell you, there's nothing like going into every uh, every prenatal appointment. or um, Yeah, prenatal appointment where they remind you, yes, you're a geriatric pregnancy. It's like, yes, I know. Thank you for using the word geriatric with me again. One time I had both my sons. And as you can see, my hair is white. Okay, I stopped dying. Beautiful hair, actually. It's gorgeous. But I had my two youngest sons at the post office, and one man came up to me, and they're like, oh, you get to spend a day with Grandma. And I was like, oh. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) And I had my, that one I had when I was 34, and then the other one when I was 38. So it's like, I wasn't that old. (laughs) Oh, that's terrible. That's probably a sign of things to come for me, too, I'm sure, as my son gets older and as my hair turns whiter. <laughs> it's just, well, I think I think now it's a little bit more, but, you know, when I was having my older kids, I was young. I was the young mom, and then I got to be the older mom, so I kind of got to be all of it, but anyway, it's all fun. Like, I, like we were talking about before, I mean, every age is very fun, and, you know, like, you've already got this career. You've already got, I mean, I know that it'll probably change as he gets older and stuff, but it's still, like, you've got a lot to hold on to, and your yeah. books are so good. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm, I have, I only have one more book to read this week. And then, so this today, I'm just going to take today and just like, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to feel the feels and oh, like yeah, let the book hang over, wash over you. Your book today and just kind of, you know, do some emails and not, you know, not do anything intense <laughs> today and let myself just, you know, cause I did, I became so attached to Ruby. I just loved her so much. And I, I love when I have a character that I can hold on to like her. And, Thank you, know. you. So, anyway, oh, show the cover that. one more time, and please oh, yeah. let me know when your next book. Like, I don't know when is. Do you have a date, like a next book date, or do you just do them now? Like, no, I, my guess because this one is in hardcover. It'll this one will come out in paperback. That'll be kind of like the next big thing for me. Um, and then, so I'm thinking it'll probably be. I'm just guessing, but toward the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020. That would be my guess just based on kind of the cycle that this type of book is normally on. But, yeah, this is it. So that means you get to, like, bask in that book for a while, too. I do, which is is good because there's so much to do to talk to people about it right now. I mean, you would think by my 10th book I'd be accustomed to this, but um, it's very – it takes a lot of time in, in a good way to promote a new book. I mean, you get to talk about it, you get to go to different book launches, you get to do bookstore signings, um, but sort of the groundwork of that all takes a lot of time and takes me away from writing the new book. So um, so it's good that I have the time and don't have a, you know an enormous looming book deadline immediately. I love on Instagram how when authors are getting their new books, they now have this like unboxing and they've written Oh, I know, and I didn't even do that. I should have done that. <laughs> I was going to ask so you funny. if you did that because I wanted to see it because it's so cool. 
I love the authors who are like, <gasps> like they're so excited when they actually see the cover. Because I'm sure that that is just an incredible moment when you finally see all your hard work in the book. And it is. It is. It, 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 again, it, 10 books in, it still feels, it still yeah, it doesn't get old, right? <laughs> yeah, it really doesn't. Yeah. And you're right. I need to really remind myself to stop and savor those moments a little bit more. You're completely right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, especially <laughs> yeah. in this book. I mean, this, like I said, everybody's talking about it. You're just, you know, it's going to be out there. Everybody's going to be talking about this for a while. So I am so happy yeah. that I got to talk to you. So thank I'm you for so happy to. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> I really enjoyed chatting with you. And I will have all of Kristen's links listed underneath here, along with the Amazon link that'll take you right to the book that you can now order. And uh, thank you so much, Kristen. Have a great day. Thank you. You have a great day, too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. If you made it this far, you watched my whole talk with Kristen Harmel, and I, that was absolutely one of my favorite interviews. She was so sweet, and her book is so good. Oh my God, The Room on Rue Amelie, and now I'm saying it right, which I'm really happy about. But thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, I, I'm telling you, you know, I listened to it on the audiobook, and if that's what you love to do, you will love the audiobook. I'm here to tell you. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will have all of Kristen's links listed below. And, um, and if you enjoyed watching the video, please hit like, if you'd like to get updates on all my videos, please hit subscribe. Thanks everyone.